Hello, and welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast, stories of transformation and tools to get you there. I'm your host, Mark Sheff, and today I had a chance to talk with fellow coach Tristan Soames. I say fellow coach and there's a pause because Tristan is so much more than that. He's an NLP master teacher. He's a photographer, a motorcycle, motorcycle rider. He calls himself a cat lover, an entrepreneur. He's done so many things in his life and had so many different experiences. In this conversation, we get to talk about some of them, and we actually talk about some of the good ones and the bad ones and how he, as an expert in this field, suggests that you can actually use those use the, the practices to actually become sort of better on the other side of some of these difficult experiences and conversations that we can have in our life. Tristan runs certified NLP retreats every year. He helps people create lives where the impossible becomes inevitable. So without further ado, let's hear from Tristan. Yeah, good. I'm really excited to be here and uh, yeah, ready to dive in. <laughs> well, I'm really curious about, we didn't talk about this in the pre-call, but I am curious, what drew you to Ibiza? Good question. Uh, sunshine. Um, <laughs> so when I was about six years old, my parents moved down to southern Spain and we lived there for a while. And so I grew up in the sun. So I guess my earliest memories were sort of four or five and then six was formative living in the sun. And then I moved back to England when I was about seven to live with my grandparents and I went you know, as you probably know, the weather in England's not great. Uh, so miserable grey weather and the contrast never sat well with me. And so I then came on holiday to Spain, uh, you know, when I was about sort of 18 and I landed in Ibiza for a holiday when I was about 20 and I just fell in love with the place uh, and I felt back at home. And yeah, just that contrast of the sun and the sand and the sea, the lifestyle, that kind of holiday vibe, uh, very different to that more sort of rigid English uh, mentality and also the weather. Yeah, so there's a big, there's transformation number one from growing up in, in England. I spent some time uh, in London, uh, lived there for a little bit. The weather was was very different. We go to Ireland many years, but you've also traveled all over the world. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of those, some of those trips? Yeah, so I mean, I, I suppose, you know, Spain set me up to experience and enjoy different cultures. And I, I came back here many times and then moved here. Um, but I also went to India in 2008 and I just fell in love with the place. So yeah. I lived there for about six months the first year and then I went back again the second year and the third. And I went to India for probably a decade and started you know, running retreats and the like out there. And then I, someone I met in India who lived in South Africa asked me to go and train there. So I uh, went and ran some stuff in the townships in South Africa. And then I have friends you know, all over the world. I spent a lot of time uh, in Malaysia, sometime in the state. I eventually made it to South America, Central America the last couple of years. But yeah, never quite made it to down to Australia or New Zealand. But yeah, love traveling. I did a lot of Europe. How does travel, I am curious, like how does travel tie into the work you do as, I don't know if you use this, but you know, a coach who really works people through, you know, big transitions, big transformations. So I think one of the things that I'm really aware of as a coach and just as a human is the difference the differences between us. And I think if you look at, for example, what's going on around the world now or in American politics, it's all about how we're different mm. and that's getting amplified. And what I've experienced, you know, for example, in India or in South Africa is our sameness. You know, I can be with people in the townships who have nothing, but they have heart and soul and passion and a desire to connect and learn and make a difference in the world. And so it's our shared humanity that unites us, you know, and I, I forget what the question was now. I'm, I'm sort of, I, I, I was thinking you're answering it. I was curious curious how it ties into to the the work if at all you know to the work that you do but i'm hearing that you know it, it it's a it's a way of getting that perspective i share that my kids both speak spanish and and we when they were much younger they we you know we did a lot of maybe less reading than parents should do before they have kids but we did some reading and one of the things that we discovered was that or we, you know that science has shown is that if you have if, um, if you're bilingual, especially, you know, as a kid, they've seen that kids who are bilingual have much more empathy and have much more ability to, you know, to see connections in, in, in various ways. And there's, you know, there's there's details on that. But basically, you know, basically they have more empathy because they're they're literally thinking in another in another way that, like, that's, yeah. that, you know, that's different maybe from, you know, typical, you know, kid in Brooklyn or something. Um, and that was really interesting. And that's what I'm hearing you say as well. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I was listening to something yesterday uh, with exactly the same thing, like, you know, travel broadens the horizon as we all know it. And yeah, for me, spending time in different countries, different cultures, it expands my mind, gives me deep and empathy. And then in terms of the work, you know, to work with people who are from a totally different culture, you know, India is very different working here in Ibiza, in South Africa, in Mexico. Um, do you work in all the, do you do work in all the places or? 
How, what are the not so much now so i'm very much settled here in Ibiza, but i have done i run a retreat in mexico a couple of years ago i spent a lot of time in india running retreats and a lot of time in south africa as well but since covid i've sort of based myself here and online yeah but i miss it i miss it i was actually lying in bed last night thinking of india i was like oh god i miss it well you know in our conversation that we had uh yesterday before before this call you you brought up something that really resonated with me around you know when we're in a path of transition and and we can use all the woo woo words transformation and 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 I and I'm I'm right there with you but fundamentally if you're going through you know a big change and maybe it's a professional maybe it's personal you know maybe it's a relationship um you know there's no there's no one sort of path where thing you know things get better and then they get better and then they get better like that you know it's more like um as they say in the good place uh, uh, Jeremy Jeremy um if you've ever seen that show it's more like a kind of a windy thing and you're not going to feel you, you could feel great one day and the next day not and you and I were sharing a story of really feeling uh, quite triggered and and, and I want to be clear that I'm using that term in the in the true sense where something's happening and we realize that it's it's starting to sort of needle in on some past experience that we have. Do you want to share about your experience with that? And, and I want to also talk about what we discovered uh, in that conversation. Yeah, it feels like, where do I dive in? I mean, I guess um, I caught myself um, being triggered towards the end of last week. There was a sort of compounding effect of multiple events, one upon another. Um, and I didn't catch myself really until Monday. So it's probably over three days. And by Monday, I was like, oh, wow, that's complex PTSD. Mm. And I only self-diagnosed last year when I ended a relationship and realized, oh, <clears throat> I'm in a dysfunctional relationship, basically recreating my childhood where I'm not being seen, I'm not being heard, I'm not being valued and so on. And so, yeah, I kind of caught myself going into this downward spiral. And there's an enormous, I've got a load of learning from that and a real gift uh, and insight, but it comes from childhood. Like that basically complex PTSD is sustained. P so PTSD tends to be a sort of one-off event, you know, a, a bomb, a car crash or something yeah, like that. Right. Death. Complex PTSD is where we have a sustained stress through time. That's basically my childhood. Yeah, I, I think it's also, I think when it's in childhood, especially, it's also called, you know, an alternative childhood experience, which is, you know, another way of saying physical or emotional abuse, but yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we all have, you know, some level of trauma, it just depends on the depth. Um, but certainly childhood PTSD or complex PTSD can be profoundly, well, it's it's actually what I heard it described as is a, a brain injury. Um, huh. So we have these developmental stages as children. And if you're not in a place where you feel safe and supported and connected we end up doing three things which is we dysregulate so our nervous system gets dysregulated we disconnect from ourselves our authentic self others you know hope and we have self-defeating behaviors so mm -hmm. i caught myself doing this last weekend i was like oh wow i'm back into the kind of like disconnected dysregulated state and yeah you know that comes from childhood had a pretty crazy wild wacky ride when I tell people about it, they're like, wow, that sounds great. I'm like, yeah, it's not all great. But um, mm. yeah, my parents are hippies and people go, oh, wow, that's amazing. I'm like, yeah, it came with downsides as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I want to ask, um, thank you for sharing that, first of all. I know it's not always it's not always easy. I think it sounds like you've, you've had some good support and good practice around that. I want to ask about something that we talked about yesterday, but I also sort of wonder, you know, I know so many people, you know, being a being a, coming from having a creative background, you know, as as I do and working with artists uh, for, for many years and, you know, creative people in general. I feel like there's a high there's a, a lot of the population is is dealing with something, if not exactly that, you know, something something sort of like that, whether it's whether it's a, some sort of trauma in the background. I don't know that anyone I know is immune from that. And the people who, you know, I know who maybe wouldn't even consider, you know, their background to be formative in that way and i won't use the word i won't overuse the word i'm not going to say everybody's traumatized but we all have these experiences that you know that sort of form you know who we are and what we believe about the world we create you know we're, when we're kids we have these people who are telling us what real is and what true is and what right is and what wrong is and so we make these stories and then sometimes it, you know suddenly you're in your mid-40s and you go yeah. i didn't know that i believed that but i wonder if i wonder if that experience I wonder if there's a relation. I don't know. I wonder if there's a relation between that and I know, you know, here I am doing this work, here you are doing this work. I wonder if people had these experiences also feel drawn to this kind of healing work in a way, whether it's art or coaching or something like that. What are your thoughts? I'd say almost invariably. I mean, not universally, clearly, but I mean, it's a, I can speak from my own experience, right? I was searching for something. I came from a broken home. 
had a broken heart. You know, my parents left me when I was six, seven years old to live with my grandparents who were both colonels in the army. And prior to that, you know, it was, there was violence and drugs and all sorts of stuff. Mm. Uh, and so I couldn't make sense of the world. I had a, you know, a brain injury. I had a trauma driven belief system. I'm not safe. I'm not loved. I'm not wanted. I'm not valued. I'm not home, literally and metaphorically. And so I was searching for meaning, for connection, for love, for truth. And I didn't really find it. For me, society was very much driven by profit and, you know, commercial interest and, you know, people's self-interest. And I was like, this doesn't feel right. And yeah, you know, then I came across yoga and Tai Chi and meditation and things like that in my 20s. Started to hear about this word depression. I was like, oh yeah, that's, I'm pretty sure that's what I got. But I was seeking, I was searching for something to fill the void or, or to heal. And that's when I stumbled across NLP. Mm. And I think that's what tends to happen, right? We do the best we can. And we are, I say we generally, we are searching for something that will give us a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, a sense of connection, love, um, healthy relationships, meaningful work. And for many people that takes them into that kind of personal development realm or coaching or healing, um, which for me all sort of interrelated. One or maybe many of my coaches, I've, I've heard them say, if you want to know who your client is, look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, and I know people have said about there. I know we're not therapists, but people say about therapists that many, you know, pe people going to therapy sort of figure them, themselves out. And I, I can relate as someone who's, you know, and I hear, and I hear you saying the same. Something, something that we talked about yesterday that I want to make sure that, that we get to was interesting because I asked you, I'd love you to share here. Let's say we're having an experience that, it, you know, that's causing, causing us to feel heightened emotion. You can use the, you know, whatever word you want to use for that. We're, we're feeling like we're not making maybe the best decisions or, or it's hard to think. I know people experience these, you know, these things differently. But what would you say? <laughs> like, what's the answer? How do you fix it? Um, but what it, what are some things in your, you know, I know you're, you know, an NLP master teacher, you've got tons of training, um, somatic training and all these different things. So what are some things that that truly do help people manage those those experiences and sort of come out a little bit better on the other side? I mean, I think there are a number of ways to answer that. But the, the one word that pops out to me is distinctions. I think the greater the number of distinctions we can make, the more influence or choice we have in our lives. And so, you know, for example, if I come, if I sort of start at the foundations of NLP, there's a distinction between present state and desired state. Present state is, you know, I have heightened emotions, my, my thoughts are racing. Okay, what's my desired state? To slow down, to feel relaxed, to come back into my body. So being able to make distinctions is key in terms of how we can shift. One of the distinctions that, are, you know, has really helped me is to recognize that feelings or heightened emotions don't just happen in and of themselves. There is something that happens before that. And typically the sequence goes something like this. There's an external event. You know, we process that through our filters, you know, what we see, hear and uh, uh, feel. And we then make up meaning. We create what I call an internal representation. So the principle is that mm. what we see and hear in our mind is what we think about influences our feelings. Our feelings become our behavior. Behavior becomes, you know, character. Character becomes destiny. So it all starts with what we see and hear in our mind's eye. And hence, for example, with a trauma-driven belief system, something happens out here, we make meaning in here through our thinking, which creates heightened emotions. So for me, it's like backing up. In fact, I think we were talking about getting to the fact. You said yesterday, when it comes to trauma, it's like, hang on, hang on, what's going on? What's the what's the reality? Let's ground ourselves on what's actually happening. That's often quite different to what's happening in here. So what I do with you know, myself and clients, hang on, let me back up to the data. Let me back up to what I'm seeing and hearing in my mind's eye. Is that true? Is it real? What else could it look like? What else could it mean? that can then shift the emotions and very quickly you know when we start to use language to reorganize and shape our experience we can change how we feel yeah yesterday we we were also talking about that's great and probably hard to do you know in the moment and certainly hard to do in the moment having never done it <laughs> yeah so yeah. so what are some things that you do or you do with your clients that give them that sort of build that muscle where when the moment comes, you know, like I train jujitsu. I love talking about it. I'll talk about it for hours. And, you know, I wouldn't step on the mat in a competition uh, having never done it. 
you know, or maybe not even in my first week doing it. It's a very, you know, it's a very intense, it can be a very intense experience. I want to make sure that I've got some training and I build some muscle so that when I get on the mat in an unknown situation with an unknown, you know, opponent, much like situ- like everything we do in life, sometimes we're like, we don't know who we're dealing with. We don't know what they're thinking. We don't know what they're going to do. But when you, you know, when I, when I step on the mat, having had sort of practice with all of my different, you know, training partners, I know that I've got enough, whatever, whatever skill or, or ability or, you know, whatever to, to at least, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to die. So my fight flight response doesn't, doesn't really kick in. So maybe it doesn't have to be jujitsu, but if it is, we can talk a lot about it. Um, <laughs> what are, what are some things that people can do to sort of strengthen this muscle of really noticing when they're feeling uh, that heightened emotion and, it, and they want to back up to the data? Yeah. So for me, I mean, I think meditation is a core aspect of my life now and I know in fact that's one of the things I stopped last week right I stopped I wasn't meditating I wasn't going walking in nature so I'm stopping those you know those muscles those ways of being or engaging with myself and life or that's what I did I stopped but it's a foundational um, practice to be present there 10-20 10-20 minutes a day it doesn't need to be hours just having that practice of coming back into the moment noticing what's going on that gives us choice it gives us an awareness of like what oh this is my present state or oh, i feel tense ah, now i can relax so meditation i think is foundational um and the other is you know conditioning and practice so for example you know you go to jujitsu once a year you're going to get smacked right <laughs> you go once a week you're going to you're going to be you know more on your toes you go you know three four times a week you're going to be in optimal shape so you know, I run uh, courses and programs and regular events online where my community come and join and we hang out and we sit and we talk. Hey, what's your present state? Where are you at? What's your challenge? And we use language and coaching to shift state to go, oh, right, that's what I want instead. So I think being able to make those distinctions linguistically, you know, because language shapes every aspect of our experience and it's processed at the unconscious level. So most people are swimming in languages, fish in water, completely unconscious of how it's affecting them and others. And so starting to bring that meditative, attentive quality to how we're using language with ourselves or with others, which is intrinsically tied into how we're thinking, gives us more choice, more freedom, but it's a muscle, you've got to work it. And so the more regularly you go to jujitsu or you go to the you know, linguistic gym or the mental gym, the more capacity you now have to be able to shift and change and adapt to what's going on or what you want or to be able to shift your state. Yeah, that resonates. Well, that resonates with me. It reminds me of, I mentioned the fight or flight thing. And um, I was reading, I think it's the new the new book. It's called How to Work with Almost Anyone. It's the new book by Michael Stanier. And he actually, I think it's in this book. He, he, he says that there's, you know, he, he thinks that there's sort of three responses. There's, there's fight and there's flight and then there's fix. So the, the idea being that fight and flight are both extreme, you know, in, in a way like extreme responses. And, it, and they're both, they're both responding and reacting to danger. Right. You know, you perceive danger, you either go and you fight it or, or you, you run away. But the idea that there's this I don't I don't I don't know that the word fix is actually the right word, but it, it's an F. And so I get it. But the idea that there's a third option, which is yeah. to, you know, which is which is to ground, which is to like, I love what you said before, like to sort of back up to the data and say, OK, what's what's really here? And what's the choice that I want to make, having now been in this practice of sitting with my thoughts, you know, or, or having, you know, maybe it's a physical practice or something else where I know that I don't have to, I don't have to respond in, in you know, sort of an outsized way. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say the have to, like that, that's what I call a mode of operating. It's like, I have to do this, I've got to do that. Or we have these default programs, right? We all have these patterns and they're often reactions and they're often unconscious. We just, we don't know what's going on, we just react, you know, we get angry, we fight, we fly. And the fix, I think, is for me, it's a way of responding rather than reacting, which again is bringing that mindful mm. awareness. You know, the, the, the way I have this described once is, you know, there's a stimulus and there's a response. Between the two, there's a gap. Yes. That's the data, that's the thinking, that's the belief that drives the behavior. And the more mindful we can be of how we are processing in that gap, the more choice and influence we can do, uh, we, the more choice and influence we can have. I love that. Yeah, that's really powerful really mind minding the gap so to speak well that's really wonderful i um i want to uh i feel like i feel like there's uh, a lot more we can talk about but i also do like to keep these at a you know at a pretty at a pretty short manageable clip so um there's much more there's much more for us to talk about maybe we'll we'll have to have you back but in the meantime um if people are interested in you know reading more about what you do or um, what you have to offer or if you're if you're 
putting work out there, if there's a book or something, where can where where would you like people to go to find out more? So my website's probably the easiest. I'm not uh, really on social media very much. So my website's tristansigns.com. And yeah, there's a book on there. I wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago called Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life, which is very much my personal journey with NLP. There's a lot of uh, interesting stories and anecdotes in there and a load of cool models and tools and processes um, from NLP. Uh, so yeah, that's probably the easiest on that. Download the book for free, tristansigns.com. Right. I'll, I'll put that link in the show notes with all the correct spelling and everything. Well, Tristan, it's been a real joy having you and thanks for joining us today and thanks for sharing your wisdom. No, you're so welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. What a great conversation. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I find it so hard to keep those conversations short. But what I really discovered in this conversation with Tristan was it's just amazing like how you can create a practice for yourself that builds whatever muscle it is you want so that you can respond and not react to the things in your life. Responding from this place of who you want to be as opposed to fear or discomfort or a fight or flight response. So that was great. Thank you for listening. If you're interested in finding out more about the work that Tristan does, we're gonna put the links in the show notes. You can also find my links there. And if you're interested in getting more of these episodes, please do subscribe or like or follow or whatever platform you're listening on. And if you really got a lot out of this episode, it would mean the world to me if you shared it with a friend. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on The Art of Transformation. Thank you.